On behalf of the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory, uh, we are delighted to welcome you to this year's first Learn and Grow Lecture Program on Essential Garden Tools. This Learn and Grow uh, series began several years ago as a lead into our annual plant sale, which is happening right now for our members and will open to the public on April 17th. And the Learn and Grow series is a free program happening every week in April, and it's our way to help educate and inspire gardeners to become more confident in their endeavors. So hopefully tonight um, you will feel um, really ready to get out there and um, pick up those tools with more knowledge than maybe you had before you came. A little bit back of background on the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory. We are a nonprofit organization that was formed after community members successfully came together to save the historic property, the Oak Park Conservatory, from demolition. Over the years, the Friends have supported the conservatory with grants to expand the gardens to the east and to the west of the property. We've provided hundreds of volunteers to support events and the care of plants in the facility. And we've also provided education programs such as this tonight. This year, we are celebrating our 35th anniversary and we have many events and programs in the works. So um, check out our website to learn more. And as I mentioned, our um, our annual plant sale is happening now for members and it will open in about a week for um, the public. So without further ado, it is now my great pleasure to introduce our special guest this evening. Don Necrocious is a longstanding member of the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory. He's a University of Illinois Master Gardener volunteer with certification in composting. He teaches classes in backyard and worm composting, seed starting, vegetable gardening, and garden tool care. He planted his first garden on Valentine's Day in 1972 and has been in love with flowers and vegetable gardening ever since. I also want to introduce tonight Kayla Chase, our membership chair. She is also a master gardener and she will be our presenter next week on plant dividing. So it's a new program we haven't presented before. So I'm very excited about it. So please be sure to sign up for that. She will also manage the chat box for your questions and she will handle the Q&A at the end of our program this evening. So um, without further ado, I welcome you all and I would like to turn it over to Don to share his screen with us and um, we'll um, hopefully wrap up at about 10 to 8 and allow for Q&A. We may go over a few minutes. So um, let's Take it away, Don. Good evening, and uh, again, my name is Don Necrocious. Please be patient as we kickstart and get the screen up for uh, the show. And we're almost there. There we go. This is the opening slide. And uh, I wanna welcome you to this quick talk overview of Garden Tools. Um, Hello to a bunch of old friends. I've seen your names on the marquee there, and also hello to new people. Uh, the one person who's at great disadvantage here is Ellen Kuhner, who took the tool care workshop in person. So Ellen, it'd be fun to talk about the comparison between this and the one that you took some years ago. Um, I am a master gardener. I've been a, a friend of the Oak Park Conservatory since 1983. And basically we're gonna review a whole bunch of tools and make some suggestions about what you might do with some of them. You tired of winter yet? Remember all those cold, cold days below zero and 24 inches of snow that never melted and that, that more than a week where we had measurable snow for nine days in a row? Amazing. Well, here's me in the smart home garden and I wanted to point out a couple of things here. You'll notice the uh, garden knife uh, in, a, in a sheath on my hip when I'm gardening, it is often with me. In my back pocket is a trowel and uh, a hat and glasses and gloves. All things I strongly suggest that you think about using a sunscreen as well when you're outdoors and, uh, and working in the garden. Really, you know, the first tool in gardening is you, your body uh, itself, and especially your hands. So you want to take care of them. Some people play with big tools like this one that I was plowing under a buckwheat green manure or cover crop or bigger tools when it comes time to mow the grass uh, or even bigger tools sometime where you have an awful lot of fun. I once chased a coyote around with this machine. But take a look at this antique tool poster. Take a second to glance at as many tools as you can gobble up and realize that you're pretty much using the same tools. They might look a little bit different, but 
we've been using the same garden tools for a long time. So our gardening is in, in uh, a longstanding tradition. The first tool I wanted to talk about is one you probably have in your possession. If not, I strongly encourage you getting a look at this. I know our, our Oak Park Library has it, this book. It's a great resource by uh, Oak Parker Beth Botts, who is a master gardener an author. Uh, she was the garden journalist for the Chicago Tribune and has worked for various magazines. This is a magnificent, magnificent uh, uh, resource for you uh, for edibles, for bulbs, for perennials, for ornamentals. Very, very uh, good looking uh, book that's very, very useful. What I did is I took a look at the sidebar for April since we are here in April and her uh, suggestion is how to buy a good plant. And I suggest to take down, go down to the fifth bullet point where she says usually it's best to, re, uh, to resist buying plants in full bloom. You know how uh, uh, purveyors of plants often put plants out that are blooming and trying to sell us on colors and look, but you know that you want them to bloom in your garden. The next bullet point is kind of interesting too, saying that the exception to that is buying plants like cool season annuals such as pansies and primulas. And her book is chock-a-block loaded with these kinds of very practical suggestions. The next is a, a suggestion for a tool is a gardener's journal. I believe that in that old saying, uh, an unexamined life is not worth living. And I believe that about gardening as well, that it really helps to be reflective at various points when you're gardening and a journal will be a place where you can do that, to sit down and write for yourself what's going well, what, what uh, came up and when it came up, what you planted, uh, and what you hear about is interesting plants. So I especially like to do this at the end of the season uh, to make a record of what happened as a sort of reflection. And then towards the end of winter, I do a projection, go back to that writing and remember what I need to order, what I don't want to plant anymore. Uh, it doesn't have to be this fancy 10 year chronicle. Any kind of journal uh, uh, is helpful. Although I imagine today, some of you would do it online. I duplicated just the April page from the journal I just showed you. And if you speed read down through these bullet points, you'll see some very practical things that will uh, keep you from sitting around uh, these April days, uh, including planting and raking and fertilizing. Uh, look towards the middle and you'll see lots of edibles that can be planted. Uh, removing winter mulch, uh, about the fifth one up from the bottom. Although I've recently heard that it's a good idea to leave mulch in place and leaves in place until the temperature gets to about 50 degrees to give insects a chance to uh, come alive and uh, uh, get going with their, with their life cycle. And uh, some of you know this, those of you who are master gardeners know this very well. Uh, if you're looking for a authoritative research-based information, uh, a way to find it is by accessing the information at universities. And the way to do that, let's say you are interested in hydrangeas. After you put hydrangea in a search engine, follow it with .edu, and that will lead you to university-based information the solid stuff that uh, is, is proven to be true. Also, I've highlighted on this screen, Hort Corner, which is the University of Illinois Extension Gardeners website. And that's a wonderful a pointer to all kinds of other links that'll answer many of your questions, including it has a plant clinic. So if you, if you have particular questions, uh, that will help. I'm gonna consider some tools over the next couple of minutes, starting with a, a bottom heat map, a grow house, uh, a suggestion for used containers, Jude twine, a tub trug, dandelion weeders, and garden knives. One of, our, one of our volunteers wisely suggested that if you're looking for tools, one place to start is garage sales, flea markets, estate sales, looking for the old tools that are generally much higher quality than you can buy these days because so much is mass produced someplace else. Uh, with a little tender lo loving care, cleaning them, sharpening them, removing the rust, uh, you can have a very high quality, long lasting tool for a much uh, more reasonable price. So uh, it's a way to look for a tool. This slide is for a, a composite slide. So we're trying to cover a couple of topics here. It starts with that bottom heat map there. That's that black material with green squiggles on it, writing on it. And if you've never used a heat map to start seeds before, you'd be surprised how wonderful it is, especially for plants like coal family plants or lettuces or even flowers like uh, uh, zinnias that just jump up faster than you would expect because of the bottom heat. Then you'll see some trays loaded with potting or medium. Uh, generally, we say use a soilless medium uh, and you wet it before you put it into these trays. 
put the seeds in and then you cover them to the appropriate depth. And then you notice there's, there's clear plastic over the top of the trays. That's to hold the moisture in while they're sprouting. There's also plastic labels to identify what it is that you've planted and these can move on to the next stage, which is potting up, of course, or maybe even eventually in the garden. Way over there on the left, you see what I call a repurposed feline memory box. A lot of people call it a kitty litter box, but what my suggestion is that you can use any device to uh, work as a tray. And finally, you'll see, uh, it's, though it's only in silhouette, is the uh, uh, shop lights above the, the growing medium here. That's two to four inches above for about 12 to 14 hours a day. You wanna keep it really close to the plants because what you're trying to grow is stocky, I'm sorry, thick, sturdy stems, not the high willowy ones, but rather a strong plant that will do well in the future. Here's a suggestion to use old uh, potting pots of various sorts. Some of these are nursery pots, some of these are indoor display pots. Uh, I don't tend to throw them away, I save them, clean them. Uh, if you see duct tape, it, that's closing up the uh, various holes because I put my dahlia rhizomes away in vermiculite uh, and always seems the rhizomes come out better than they went in. And then I take the vermiculite, mix it with uh, a good potting soil and then refill these with the, uh, with the rhizomes and start them. And you'll see the dahlias in the upper left and lower left corner that will result from good dahlia care. It's a wonderful plant with beautiful, beautiful blossoms. Um, I hope you grow them. Uh, here's a tool that many people overlook. It's a, a temporary grow house, not terribly expensive. And its great purpose is as a transition from seedling to potting up. You know, oftentimes uh, we've started our seeds as May has come around, the conservatory plant sale is here. We tend to buy a bunch of plants, some of which are tender annuals, but it's too cold to leave them outside. Yet we want them to get a lot of sun to go on. And so uh, that's what this uh, particular device is good for. It may look large, but actually it all breaks down into a box that's about 14 by 16 by, I would say 40 inches long and stores very nicely in an attic garage or wherever. Uh, all of the, gray, uh, the green rays or pipes that you see break down into smaller pieces in that clear plastic cover. Well, it's a bit fragile, can last a, a bunch of years. Here's another shot of it on the inside. And you can see plants that I've started from seed in the lower right and in the upper left. Also conservatory sale plants that sometimes might be a little too cold in, in uh, May. One of the things I do is I put two five gallon buckets of water on the floor in this uh, grow house and let the sun heat it during the day and it radiates the heat back at night so that uh, it, it has an evener temperature. I really love this thing. And uh, uh, if you have never tried one, uh, it might be fun to go in with somebody else on it. A lot of people don't think about uh, uh, twine, uh, which is very, very useful in a variety of ways, uh, like, uh, of course, marking out rows or laying out on the ground if you want some kind of exotic pattern. One guy I know took uh, the garden twine and put four stakes in the ground to create a square, and then he connected them on the diagonal. And in each of those triangles, he grew lettuce of different colors. So he had a spectacular lettuce garden using twine again. Uh, and it's also good for tying around your finger if you forget to remember what you forgot. Uh, and over on the uh, tub trug, literally it's called a trug, but that's a confusing word because that's the word we use to, uh, for a gardening uh, a receptacle for harvesting. But this is a great device for moving things around uh, in the garden. If you have plants you want to bring over to a garden site to install, or you have some compost that's finished, uh, or almost anything, they're light, they're sturdy. Uh, it's really quite a wonderful device. We all know about trowels uh, and here's a selection of them. Uh, I wanna highlight the fact that there are you know, varieties of sorts with different size blades on them, larger blades there on the left, a long handled one in sort of the middle and then shorter, uh, narrower blades and ending in a fork. I did wanna make a, a mention about the tang, which is the, the uh, metal part that goes into the handle. That should be very, very excuse me, very, very sturdy because if it's not, they bend like the long handled wooden handled one in the middle. If you thrust it into the ground and heave backwards, you're very likely to break that blade off. You can, uh, I've asked some questions up there at the top, which one of these would you use to weed? Which one to transplant? How about scoop up fertilizer or mix amendments or aerate the soil? There's lots and lots of function for various size uh, trowels. Here's two uh, that we would be using uh, even now. The turf weeders on the left, as I've, I've, I've titled them, really are best used to get rid of dandelions. The pointed one on the left, those fishtail 
next to it. As you know, uh, dandelions are not everybody's favorite weed, and this is a perfect time to go get them because the ground is soft, at least especially with this rain. And uh, as you know, you thrust one of these right down alongside the root, bend back pretty far, and trying to bring up the whole root. If you leave into a little piece of, piece of it, you'll end up uh, uh, keeping the dandelion growing there. And when you do that, you can just grab the world at the top, wiggle it a little bit, and typically you get the whole root out. Uh, and then step down the, the uh, divot that you made, and the divot, in effect, aerates the soil. Everybody's got a favorite garden tool. I, uh, I, if I did not remember to say, please take it a second during the talk here to use the chat function to send Kayla a, uh, a single word description of your favorite garden tool, whatever it is. And we'll tote up that at the end. So you should be able to do that with your chat. This is mine, uh, a one of the two, actually. This is a garden knife. Uh, it's got a stainless steel uh, blade, which uh, again is easy to keep clean. It's got a serrated edge. I love to use that serration for cutting clumped uh, plants and separating them uh, or cutting anything out of the soil. Uh, I use it as a, a, a transplanting. I use it to weed. I use it to cut twine. It's quite a versatile tool and it often hangs in my belt as I'm working in, in a garden for a long period of time. Here's a couple of weeders, hand weeders, for example. The one on the left is a left-handed offset weeder, which is very nice for getting in close to the base of a plant and getting those weeds out. You know, a plant like uh, anything in the allium family has lots and lots of roots right near the surface. And if you don't keep it weed-free, they just don't grow very well. You won't get big onions unless they're relatively weed-free. Or that claw on the right, which is great for aerating, especially after a rain when the soil has compacted and has a crust on it, it's important to break that crust up and to let air back into the soil. So uh, uh, these are uh, both have a wooden handle uh, to them. Uh, everybody uses, uh, most everybody uses these long handled loppers for uh, cutting larger stems. Uh, you have to be a little careful around fences because fences seem to be invisible and you can grab hold of them and uh, uh, hurt the blade. This blade is, is taken care of and sharpened just like you would hand pruners. There's pretty, three pretty obvious tools, huh? A hoe, a bow rake in the middle, and a cultivating fork on the top, sometimes called a potato fork. Notice the wooden handles. These are distressed and would need treatment. And it's pretty easy to do. You use sandpaper to take down all the rough spots or any raised wooden grain. And then you treat it with boiled linseed oil, which is a wonderful product. Comes from the linum plant, same thing that gives us linen. And uh, it preserves wood, anything that's wooden in the garden benefits for a treatment with linseed oil, boiled linseed oil, not raw. Raw, raw linseed oil takes a long time to dry. The trouble with the boiled linseed oil is once you put it on a rag, that rag, if it were stored in a, a closed container, can spontaneously combust. So you want to discard those in the trash. And here's a couple more tools that are typically used around gardens. The square headed shovel on the left, again, with a uh, wooden handle that needs work. The garden fork, which is very typically used this time of year to fluff up and turn soil or to turn in uh, top, uh, top dressing of either leaf mulch or uh, compost. And you'll notice the wooden handle down towards the bottom has a nice brown patina to it. That's what they look like, uh, brown wooden handles look like when they're, uh, when they're treated correctly. And over in the right is an edger. A lot of people use weed whippers or a mechanical edger. Uh, you can use this kind as well. Here's an interesting comparison before, between the traditional long-handled shovel and a, an unusual uh, short-handled shovel with a fiberglass handle and a ring uh, grip to it. You won't see that very frequently. It's got a strange little blade that's narrow towards the bottom with a blunt edge. This is a favorite tool of uh, somebody you well know, Sue, uh, uh, who is the, I believe, president of Fopcon, right? And, uh, uh, what, what makes a good tool is a question you might pose to yourself. Well, it's got good balance to it. It fits in your hand. It is appropriate to your body type. It works well with, for the job you're trying to get done. And it's the one that you reach for. That's how you know it's your favorite tool because it's never very far away from you. And this is Sue Boyer's. Here's a couple of tools for cutting limbs and larger. You can even cut down a tree with the thing on the left, the bow saw and a pruning saw. Let me first say, please wear gloves when you use either of these two because they're very sharp. And especially when you start sawing on something, uh, a blade has a, tends to, a tendency to judder up and out of the kerf and can contact your hand and you don't want that to happen. Uh, blood really doesn't make a garden grow better. Blood meal does, but not blood. 
so wear gloves. The, uh, the pruning saw in the right is an interesting tool. It's long and thin bladed. You'll see that from the sheet that it's sitting in. And that tells you something. It only cuts on the draw, not on the push stroke. And the reason for that is because it's got a long thin blade. If you were to push, you could blend it, uh, bend it very easily and uh, make it not very useful anymore. So these are good for cutting limbs and even small trees and other shrubs. Here's a tool that's very, very favorite to lots of people with yards. It's a garden cart. And it's used for hauling anything, hardscape, soil, plants, uh, anything you can imagine. Uh, and I like to put a board over the top of this, doesn't cover all, all of it, just a board. And my uh, potting soil inside the, the cart, my plants that I want to transplant and the empty, empty containers on top. And I do all my transplanting right here. I don't make a mess anywhere. And uh, also it is in effect a portable uh, gardening uh, table. Uh, but it's, it's, it's good for lots and lots and lots of purposes. Here's another example of a garden cart on your left. It's got an aluminum frame with flotation tires and a fiberglass barrel or container. And it's chock-a-block loaded with leaves right now, autumn leaves. And what I do with those autumn leaves is I grab them in a handful and throw them in the bottom of this little barrel in the middle. And then I lower that electric weed, weed whipper and run it for 10 seconds. And what happens when I do that is I get this easily shredded leaves which then I move over to the larger barrel and write and pack it down with my foot so that I can make three barrels like this that are the browns for my compost system for the entire year. Nothing is better for, uh, as browns go than leaves. And uh, well, maybe, maybe uh, poultry manure or other kinds of uh, manure, but uh, leaves are just magnificent. Uh, as you know, there is a carbon to brown, I'm sorry, a carbon to nitrogen ratio uh, for making good compost and a lot of people fail to put enough browns in with their greens. So the real number is 30 to one. A way to kind of think of that is lots of browns and some greens. So when I come out of the kitchen with a container of uh, pairings and leavings, I also add out water to that on my way out. I dump that in the compost barrel and I put some leaves over it. What I do then next is stir it. And these are two compost stirrers. If you don't have a compost stirrer, you really should think about it. The one on the left is an auger that you screw in, uh, as you can imagine, and the one on the right is a butterfly auger, uh, a butterfly uh, compost stirrer, which you thrust right down into the compost, uh, to the base of it, and those flanges at the bottom flare out, and as you jerkily bring it up, you do two things. You both stir the compost, and you also aerate it. Compost needs moisture and air to succeed, as well, as, of course, the greens and the browns. So if you don't have one of these, you should put that on Santa's list if you're a composter. And speaking of composters, here's a couple of examples of what are called earth machines. These are black plastic, recycled plastic, very light, but very sturdy. Um, they come in three parts. If you look at the one on the left, it's, there's a bottom, a top, and then the screw off uh, cover for it. Uh, these are uh, wonderful ways to make compost. You'll see the aeration slots on the right. Um, th if you look at the middle of the one on the left, the, the kind of seam that joins the two parts, I have screwed them together so that when it gets full, I take twist off that top, I grab hold of the upper portion and just lift it up in the air. It's very light, it's about five pounds. And then I can take a fork and just turn it over into the other one. It's a great way to turn a compost heap. A couple of things to mention quickly is you'll notice at the base, there's a two by, five, two by four frame that they sit in. And on the underside of that is stapled quarter inch hardware cloth. Mice can't get through a quarter inch. So these are vermin proof um, and, and mice are, uh, or uh, squirrels don't chew into it like they seem to our uh, refuge containers in the alleys. Uh, so this is a, a great, great tool for those of you who uh, like a convenient composter. Very quickly, I wanted to mention the materials that we use to clean and preserve tools. That top uh, bunch is really the, the, the kind of liquids and, and elements that we use, alcohol, of course, mild soap, uh, sandpaper and steel wool, brush, either wire or bristle, and frequently water and a cloth. Down there towards the lower portion, mineral oil, which is a, a, one of my favorite uh, um, min, uh, things to use because it's, it's natural. If it gets back into the soil, it will just uh, disappear. Uh, it's great for not only protecting metal, but as a lubricant uh, in any moving part, uh, adding a drop of mineral oil will make things uh, move much better. 
Uh, there's the boiled linseed oil again and petroleum jelly, which is especially useful for storing tools in the wintertime. The spreading a thin film of petroleum jelly over the tool will keep it from rusting. I do mention in those little asterisk uh, comments, there's some other materials. If you have really heavy rust, you can use navel jelly, but you have to be careful. It's phosphoric acid and it should be used where it's well ventilated and where you have access to water and can wash it off when you're done working with it. CLR, we've all heard about, as well as orange terpene. These are uh, acids that will, again, remove rust and dirt. Notice the highlighted statement, read and follow label directions. This is something master gardeners chant to themselves all the time, and you should uh, obey this as well. When you get anything to work, uh, any um, oil or whatnot, read the directions on the label. If there's any warnings, pay attention to it, because you don't want to hurt yourself, you don't want to hurt your land, you don't want to hurt the animals and uh, any, anybody else around. So again, that's a very important thing to follow. To get some with specific tools, here we have uh, what many times is most frequently used, hand pruners. The one at the top is a bypass pruner, very much like a scissors. Uh, the lower portion is the cutting blade. The upper portion is the jaw that the uh, cutting blade moves right past. The lower one is an anvil pruner. The dark is the uh, uh, lead portion is the blade and the silver colored portion is a piece of metal that the blade uh, contacts straight down onto. You wouldn't use this on live material, the anvil pruner, because it crushes the stem. And when you do that, you leave the stem, op stem open to disease and to insects. It's typically used for things that you want to crush, like ingredients going into a compost bin. So uh, we're getting closer to sharpening uh, the, the uh, hand pruners. And these are typical tools that you use for sharpening. Whetstones on the top. I especially like the middle, uh, uh, medium size and small size. Down towards the bottom, you have some diamond impregnated uh, wands, uh, as well as a ceramic with that black handle. And over on the right, a Swiss sharpener and also a metal a sharpening tool that's impregnated with diamond dust. Uh, all of these can be used for sharpening, not just garden tools, but anything that you have need to put a sharper blade on. So let's talk about sharpening a hand pruner, something you should be doing fairly frequently because we do use it a lot, right? In pruning and even in harvesting and uh, uh, neatening up a, a garden area. And what we're working on uh, is the, the blade of the tool itself uh, using a whetstone or a sharpening uh, steel. And you'll see that sort of silvery curve in the lower foreground of this blade. That's the bevel or the angle that does the actual cutting and what we're going to be working on. So if I've got it correct, the next thing will be a little video for uh, how to sharpen your hand pruners. And by the way, this is the time to use the bathroom if you really need to. I'll be back in a second. Sharpening a pair of hand pruners is a real easy, straightforward job. You use a small whetstone and you go to the bevel on the hand pruners. You can see it here, it's about 23 degrees. And if you look carefully, there's even a notch that's been cut into this bevel. So ideally we wanna take it off. We wanna go from the deep jaws out to the point, always pushing away, pushing and traveling, pushing and traveling. And you should begin to see that the bevel is getting lighter in color. That tells you that you're working at the right angle. We don't saw back and forth. We don't saw in one place. We travel, 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 travel. And I keep doing it until it gets evenly clean across the whole surface. This notch would take a lot more to take off. It's pretty deep. And you'll notice that I'm, I'm holding it in my hand and I've got it firm against my body so that it doesn't wiggle around. You could also do this on a firm surface. Now you see how much cleaner that bevel is, how much cleaner that blade is? Okay, now watch carefully. The next step we do is we turn it over and on the flat side, we run the uh, stone flat against the blade. And what we're doing is taking off whatever curled over metal there was. And that's all you got to do to sharpen a hand pruner. There you go. Uh, there might be some questions about that. If you've never done it before, it may seem a little unusual, but I, I want to tell you that uh, a sharp tool is safer to use. It's a lot easier to use. It respects the plants 
It's a, it makes gardening a lot more fun. And those small uh, little whetstones are available at, at typical neighborhood hardware stores for a very reasonable price. And if you're doing a lot of pruning, like uh, uh, maybe a, a couple of hours worth, it's worth putting that stone in your pocket. Here's a couple of tools, the middle one of which is my favorite, uh, as well as the gardening knife. It is a old masonry hoe used for mixing up mortar and what they call mud, concrete. And you'll notice it's got those tool, uh, two holes in it and a kind of rounded braid. This is a great tool for, uh, uh, for weeding, for making uh, trenches, for hilling up, for describing a drill where I might want to put in something like peas or beans. Uh, it's long handled, light, uh, and you'll notice that all three of those handles are long. What that indicates is that these were made a long time ago for American gardeners who were taller than uh, the gardeners the tools overseas are made for these days. I have to point out something though. The foreground tool is a bow rake and it's sitting on the ground in a very dangerous position. If you stepped on those tines, that handle would come up and give you a, a good conk on the head. Uh, so never, ever, ever lay a bow rake down on the ground like that. Um, and notice the patina on the handles. These have been treated with, uh, with boiled linseed oil and it makes them nice and smooth and takes care of them very well. The, uh, I'll explain later on why these tools are so dirty, but uh, these again are faves. I use those three to do something. There's the bow rake again with a fiberglass handle. As I said before, the fiberglass translates the tension and forces uh, up into your body rather than in the handle itself. And I wanted to point out the, the tool on the left, which is a manure fork. Its purpose is to clean out animal stalls, but it is a great tool for turning compost over as well as uh, moving and spreading mulch. So you might consider one of those. We'll talk quickly about sharpening a shovel, uh, which is uh, again, a relatively easy thing to do. The point is that when shovels come from the store, they are blunt edged so that you don't get hurt in the buying of them. And uh, well, let's see if there's another video waiting here. Uh, it will be seeing it in a second. What I did is I, I took a shovel and I belayed it. I uh, put a plank across some sawhorses. I put vices from the plank to the sawhorse and then uh, uh, firmed down the uh, shovel on the plank so that I uh, could work two-handed without it moving around. All right, I'm gonna have to. Right. Here we're learning how to sharpen a long-handled shovel. This is good for hoes and other kinds of large bladed uh, instruments that go into the soil. A hand pruner is 23 degrees, this is 45 degrees. Notice that uh, it's nicely belayed to a board, so it's nice and sturdy, doesn't move around. It's important to do, although you can have somebody else help you. I'm using a number two, I'm sorry, number 10 bastard mill file. Just a mill file, you can call. When you buy it, it doesn't have uh, a handle here. You have to buy the handle separately, and it's a really good idea because that's sharp. It's really easy to put. Okay, it's uh, it's, uh, the blade that comes blunt when they're brand new. And we want to bring it down to a 45 degree angle, really nice for cutting into the soil. We work from uh, the curve to the point, curve to the point, always on the inside and always pushing away. So this might get a tad noisy, but watch as I, as I work at it. Notice, I do not go back and forth. That's one of the hardest things to learn about this is traveling. All right, that's about all it takes. And right now I would put a little mineral oil on this to protect the raw metal, keep it from rusting. Mineral oil is organic, it's natural, it's very healthy stuff. So there you go. And actually, uh, I also, just like on the hand pruners, you have to run flat across the back to remove any of the bent over metal. You're not trying to sharpen the blade, but clearing off the metal that was bent when filing. And you should see a pretty sharp blade here. This will be going into the soil very, very easily. And that's all you got to do to sharpen a shovel or a hoe 
or any other kind of object. Lots of weeders benefit from this kind of treatment. And uh, again, if you've never done that before, it seems like a, an amazingly difficult, complex thing, but it's not. It's very straightforward. And uh, that file can be borrowed. Uh, you don't really have to purchase one. Although in this photo next to the rubber mallet, you'll see two of those files sitting up there. Uh, it's, it is uh, what makes a shovel or a hoe or other uh, imp implements that you're thrusting into the ground work so much better than the blunt end. It's, it, it's a, I think it's a little different, but it makes a little difference, but it makes a good difference. And finally, uh, how do you store your tools? Well, the old saying is hang them high to keep them dry. This, uh, this board uh, it uses the cheapest method possible of nailing nails into the, into the board and then using the handles to uh, put stuff up. It's easy to find these tools now. They're safe. They're going to be dry. They're not going to be just thrust into a bucket somewhere where they get dull or broken or tarnished or, or rusted. So this is an excellent suggestion about how to lay out tools and you'll always be able to find them. Well, one of the best gardening resources is a gardening buddy. Someone you can share ideas with, exchange seeds. Maybe you've got too many seedlings, share the harvest and ask for help when things don't just seem to be going right. No, 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 not, not like these two guys, but rather like this wonderful person, my garden buddy, Jerry, with an armload of freshly harvested garlic. Those three tools that you saw before, the bow rake, the mason uh, hoe, and uh, uh, the shovel is all, are all the tools I use to make the garden, I'm sorry, the garlic bed. And uh, as you know, when you dig garlic, uh, you don't wash it uh, to clean the soil off. You kind of tap the soil off and let them dry on screens so that they cure out of the sun where it's airy, the greens will dry off and uh, eventually you can cut them off close to the neck and trim off the roots. And then you'd like to store them, but I, I have to say, I've never been able to store garlic very long because it's so wonderful, fresh out of the garden that many people are enjoy, enjoy it as a gift. So with all the tools in the winter having disappeared, our gnome turns into the guy on the left who is succeeding at, at discovering the, uh, what are called new potatoes, those creamy, wonderful tubers that we all enjoy happening. I never realized that a grandson was a garden gnome, but that's okay. So again, a garden tool, tool care means keeping them clean and rust free, sharp and in good repair and storing them properly. And uh, uh, I ho hope that uh, all of you have taken a chance to send Kayla uh, a, a brief note about what your favorite garden tool is. And if you have any questions, uh, I, I'll be glad to ask or answer them in just a second. I do wanna give special thanks to uh, Joe Boris and my daughter, Margaret and son, Sam. Sue and Ken Boyer were very, very helpful and who there's not enough good words in the world for Judy Clem. So I want to encourage you to, uh, to uh, be a part of the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory as well as the Oak Park River Forest Garden Club. These are wonderful occasions for meeting good people, doing good work, making the village a better place. Uh, and while I didn't put it down here, uh, I would, do, would make a nod to the Park District of Oak Park just because Sandy Lenz is the president of the board. Uh, so. Again, thank you very much for listening and we'll move now to any questions you have. I think Kayla is, is uh, compiling them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in answer to your question, what were some of the people's favorite tools? Um, it looks like the trowel won out, um, but we did find some other ones. There were some interesting ones. There was the cobra head, which I, don't, I wasn't actually familiar with. I had to look it up. Yeah, so what, what is that typically used for? Uh, it's a weeder. Uh, it, it has a sort of flat flare uh, towards the business end of it and a long curving neck into the handle. And that flat flare is where the co word cobra comes from, like the hood on a cobra. The hood, yeah. yeah the hood. And, uh, I, I, I've got to tell you, I don't like to use it because it twists my wrist whenever I use it. It tends to wang left or right uh, rather than, um, as I told uh, uh, Judy once, one of the, my favorite kind of uh, weeders is a hoe that I've cut down to about two and a half feet, which is good for me bending over and reaching into a garden row. Um, but uh, uh, again, were there other ones, Kayla, that people liked? Yeah, the garden shear, um, an edger, and a hori hori, which I also was not familiar with. There must be somebody who, who knows the correct Japanese term for a <laughs> garden knife. Hori hori. Yeah, that's okay. Japanese for diggy diggy. Uh, and uh, 
I'm glad somebody said it that way. I restrained myself from uh, saying it, uh, fearing that somebody might have heard it like Ellen before and, uh, and it'd be repetitious for it. others. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so are there any tried and true kind of local resources for sharpening and taking care of the tools just in case people don't have some of these items at home or they don't feel comfortable to you know, do some of these things themselves? There are commercial enterprises locally. I don't want to use their names because I'm a master gardener and we're not allowed to do so, but you can find them relatively easy if you put in garden tools sharpening into uh, in, in Oak Park or in the near west suburbs, you would find their names. Um, there's also a couple of good tool purveyors, one in Cicero and one out in um, I'm blanking on the Westmont, uh, Lamont, that's it, it's in Lamont. And, uh, I, I gotta tell you, I wish I had a picture of it, but I, literally I took a picture of their hammer selection and there must have been 25 different kinds of hammers. So it's it's really an amazing tool uh, place to visit. And if, if any of you like tools or know somebody who does, uh, you've got to find this place. Uh, uh, it, it's really a, a treat. There's two two stores. Uh, the other thing I would say about that question of, of uh, uh, sharpening your tools. It's important to do, and I think it's important to learn the tool to do. Uh, it, it's not really all that complex. It takes some practice. The first time you don't have any idea what you're doing. The second time you hurt yourself pretty badly. And by the third time comes around, competency, competency starts to build. And before long, you're giving a tool care talk. So uh, yes, you really should take the trouble, especially on the tools that you do use often, like the hand pruners. It's pretty easy to do. Uh, and, it, and again, it's good to work with a gardening buddy. Get together with your neighbor, get one sharpening stone and work together and uh, criticize the hell out of each other. And before long, competency shows up. So kind of building on that, how often are, are you thinking that you should be cleaning and sharpening your tools? Well, uh, people hate it when I say this only because it's a, it's, it's a pain to do, but you should always clean your tools before you put them away. Uh, and the reason for that is when it comes time to garden, that's not the time you want to start cleaning or lubricating or sharpening. Your, your mind is on the task in front of you, the plants that you want to address. Uh, so the time to do it is uh, quit before you're totally exhausted and uh, take the trouble to use clean water, a brush, a soft cloth, maybe some mineral oil to uh, clean the tools and put them away in good shape. And as far as sharpening, it all depends on how often you're using a cutting blade uh, or how you're using a cutting blade. Uh, that notched uh, hand pruner that you saw uh, was probably because, again, grabbing a piece of wire fence or a rock in the soil. You, you really should never use fine blades like that in the soil. Soil is very quick to dull blades. So if you've un unfortunately done that, it, it's important to do. I know if uh, as part of a master gardener, I'm in a crew doing a lot of pruning, that stone is in my pocket and I will stop every 10 or 15 minutes, uh, both to catch a break and, uh, and to sharpen the tool. It only takes about 10 or so swipes to bring it back. When you're first doing it, it might be 20 or 25 uh, passes with the stone. So, uh, you know, get brave, uh, learn something new, right? We're supposed to be lifelong learners and uh, this extend, ex expands your gardening repertoire, to talk fancy for a second, but. Uh, and, and you, you, you develop a point of pride. You know, this is my tool. I take care of it well. Here, look, you know, so. Um, what are some of the most, like, if you were to embark on this sharpening adventure, what are the most basic things you should obtain first? I would say uh, the sharpening stones, uh, a, a medium, <clears throat> excuse me, a medium sized one and a small one, the file for uh, the shovel and hose. Um, and uh, I would also say uh, some sandpaper and uh, boiled uh, linseed oil and especially mineral oil. Again, that mineral oil, I, I use a pencil to dip into the container of mineral oil and the drop that's coming off the point of the pencil I use on all moving surfaces like the axle on a, on a blade of some sort, you know, on the, on the shears. And that lubricates them so nicely without uh, using caustic uh, chemicals of any sort. So you don't need a, a, a really complex toolkit. Uh, as you begin to uh, try to take a shovel down to its original metal, then you might wanna get into fancier chemicals. Like I said, navel jelly, which is uh, kind of dangerous to use to tell you the truth. Uh, there are other things that uh, are also a little dicey to use that, that get the job done, but I, 
I don't like to talk about them much because you don't really need to use them. Try to use clean green chemicals if you have to. Um, is there any benefit to adding turpentine to the linseed oil when you're renewing a handle? Uh, there actually is a formula uh, of uh, turpentine to linseed oil for uh, refinishing furniture. Uh, we old hippie carpenters used to use it. I think it's two to one, uh, one turpentine to two linseed oil and uh, rub it in and let it dry for a good long time and then buff it down. But yes, all you're going to do is thin out the linseed oil and there's no reason to do that. The, if you put the oil, uh, linseed oil, li boiled linseed oil again, liberally on the handle and wait 10 minutes, most of that linseed oil will soak deeper into the grain of the wood. With uh, uh, turpentine or mineral spirits, uh, you would thin that oil out unnecessarily. So you can use mineral spirits to clean off uh, pine tar or sap or uh, that technical term we use when uh, for special kinds of soil we call schmutz. And you need to get schmutz off uh, uh, mineral uh, mineral spirits is very good for it. Um, this might be a bit different of a question, but um, thinking about like a lawnmower um, and sharpening that, is there an angle? I know you were saying, you know, kind of like 25 percent or 25 grade angle but is there is there anything similar with that with a lawnmower or is that just like a completely different ball game oh no it, you know if you have um a powered lawnmower whether it's powered by uh, a gasoline engine or a battery pack uh that blade needs to be resharpened every spring a lot of people get lazy and take it to the lawnmower store and say please sharpen my blade there's no reason to do that if you uh uh, make sure that there's no uh, gas in it when you're doing this or that the cap is, is blocked from leaking up uh, gas. You can turn the lawnmower over and you have to belay the blade. And one way to do that is to push a two by four up against the blade so it cannot move. And then you take a socket wrench and there's just a single nut that's holding that blade on in the middle of the underside of the, uh, of the lawnmower. You crank that out, off comes the blade. The blade has two cutting edges on either side. You take it over, you belay it to a table with a, a, a vise, and you use that number 10 uh, uh, file and just reproduce the angle on the original blade. You'll notice that it's got nicks in it and, uh, from hitting curbs or hitting uh, hardwood sometimes, but not too much of that, more like stones. Um, and that's okay. Uh, you, you end up having a serrated edge. You don't have to take all those nicks out, but it's pretty easy to do and you get a, a, a lawnmower blade then that is uh, very, very effective. Again, you reverse the, the process and uh, put the blade back on. It used to have to balance a blade and basically you put a knife edge vertically and put the blade on top of it till it balances left and right perfectly and you mark that and make sure it went down in the middle of the, the spindle or the middle of where the nut goes back in. But nowadays they typically have little offset plugs that make it right back in the center. The other thing about uh, uh, lawnmower maintenance uh, is um, uh, while you've got it upside down, you want to scrape away all of the uh, dried grass and uh, soil that's in there. And some people put a coating of mineral oil on the underside of their lawnmower deck so that it doesn't build up so terribly much. And uh, one person I know, after ever lawn mowing, uh, tips the lawnmower up and uses a strong spray to clean all that off. It works better, especially for mulching mowers. And then just a final word or two, you want to use fresh fuel you want to change the spark plug every spring. Your, your machine will run much better with a fresh plug and also the air filter, because that often gets clogged with uh, dust and particles of, uh, of green matter and uh, your tool will run much better. You can keep a lawnmower alive years and years and years. I like a gas powered lawnmower, not because of the noise, which is obnoxious, I have to admit, but uh, everything that falls on my lawn gets run over. So if there's a stick on my lawn, it gets run over and chopped up into little pieces. I wear safety glasses when I'm mowing and ear protection because you only have those senses and you do want to protect yourself, especially your eyes, but also your ears. And uh, uh, I sort of like to chop up uh, things like uh, tomato vines. All my tomato vines get chopped up on the lawn. Initially, it looks pretty awful because it's green. Then they brown out a little bit. And before long, all the microbiological life and, and worms and whatnot come up and grab hold of all that green stuff and bring it down into the lawn. Any person who bags the lawn, bags the, lead, uh, the grass cuttings up along is nuts. If you just wait a little bit, it'll all disappear. And if it's not disappearing too much, you know what? There's a little trick. You sprinkle on cornmeal and cornmeal wakes all of those 
uh, biological life forms up and they get hungrier that you're teaching them to eat too much and uh, and they'll come you can actually watch the worms come up and grab a blade of grass and bring it down into the soil it's a, it's a lot of fun oh wow that's Long awesome for a simple question no no thank you this is perfect um we have another question about pruners um is it worth or how do you go about realigning and retightening them uh, you need uh, wrenches to uh to uh do that uh, sometimes pruners get totally out of shape and there's really not much you can do once you bend metal you've actually changed its molecular structure and you can never rebend it back to the same shape maybe a smith you know an iron smith could uh, but for all of us civilians, you really can't. Uh, if, if it's been terribly distressed, run over by a vehicle or something. Um, but oftentimes, the center nut on a pair of hand pruners uh, or loppers becomes loose. And you really need two wrenches or a vice grip and the correct size wrench to belay the nut on one side and the bolt on the other and tighten it up so that the blades come close to each other. In some cases, blades are manufactured, so they're not actually going to be touching but uh, they should slide past each other. Oh, wait till I kill that person. All right, she's dead. Uh, uh, so uh, experiments, some of them can be difficult to, uh, to align. Uh, and uh, in that case, uh, you might wanna take them to a shop. There are in the surrounding uh, areas, I don't know of one in Oak Park, uh, but I know in, a, in two surrounding suburbs, there are sharpening shops where you can take uh, anything. You can take a handsaw, uh, uh, you can take a chainsaw even uh, to get that sharpened as well. Awesome. There's another question about weeders, um, the tool. When do you recommend using the taller weeders? And then when do you recommend using the shorter weeders? Uh, it's a great question. Um, the shorter weeders, I, uh, I, I always think of the phrase stoop labor. You know, you're bent over like, uh, I think the potato farmers in a Van Gogh painting, uh, which is very, very hard on the back. Uh, so I, I tend to say use a long handle tool while standing and stretching. But if, uh, because I'm tall, I often am on my knees, hands and knees in a garden and crawling along and using the short handle tool. And I can see better close up, uh, which is why I get down low uh, to, uh, to weed at times. Weeding is, is one of those forever jobs. You know, it, it seems like it's never done. Um, and uh, uh, it, it can be enjoyable if, if you, learn uh, some Beatles songs or favorite poems or uh, don't mind singing in the garden. Uh, it, uh, it makes the time pass. Um, so I really only have two more questions. How do you sharpen a pruning, a pruning saw? Uh, sharpening a pruning saw requires a little tool called a saw set, which, is, which looks a little bit like a, a three piece thing that squeezes together and that bends over each tooth and the teeth are alternating in the bend. And so you have to be a pretty moxie tool sharpener to know how much that bend is. Whether you, uh, and then secondly, it, there's a triangle shaped file that fits in between each of those teeth that you draw a couple of times to sharpen the edge of those teeth. Don't do it, it's too much. It's a pain in the patootie, take it to a store. Um, and then, you know, I know there's always a lot of questions around composting. Um, and so I know you brought up a little bit about those composters. Is there a way to kind of go back and revisit um, the, the, the composting containers, the, the ones that you were showing, and then the, the underneath? What, what, what were you having underneath the, the composters so the animals couldn't get through? Yes, I flew, flew through that quickly as I think through lots of topics here. But uh, I think it's important to put a compost on the ground, a compost barrel uh, system, let's just say a compost system on the soil, because the soil is full of life. In one handful of soil, I like to say, are billions of life forms. Uh, you never need to have a compost starter as they try and sell you. Just a half shovel of good garden soil in your compost gives you everything you need to, to inoculate it, if you want to use that word. So to put it on the ground, uh, I've actually opened a compost bin and had a rat smiling up at me. Uh, yeah, the, the, and, and I knew that this, they had not done what uh, actually the city of Chicago requires and for its composting systems, a home composting system, you have to put it on quarter inch hardware cloth. Well, what is that? It looks like window screening, but the holes are a quarter inch in size and it's made of stouter wire. 
and you buy that wire at a large hardware store. You have to use a metal shears to cut it to size, little half inch staples to staple it to the bottom of a two by four frame, but that's, that's what the compost system sits in. And so again, there you can have migration of life forms up into the compost, except the vermin that you don't want. Um, and uh, uh, right now, those that I showed you, I, I used untreated two by fours and they're starting to distress, they're starting to rot, so they need to be replaced. Um, but it, it, it's not necessary to for a while. I, I, I jokingly say whatever the problem is, the, the solution is compost. Um, uh, in terms of uh, being a, a, a good gardener, when I first started composting, I had no idea how to do it. Um, I was using a plastic barrel that I cut the bottom out of. Uh, so that was my compost system with the top on it. And I would put everything in there, including the turkey carcass from Thanksgiving, uh, um, bones from uh, uh, ribs, so that it began to look like a, a, a graveyard in my garden. These little bones would be sticking out every which way. I've learned not to do that. Of course, you don't put meat or dairy or other things into compost. But uh, as you learn and develop uh, the skills to do compost well, you end up with a product. I have actually held a container of compost that wiggled like jello. It was so alive uh, and it is a life, almost a life form. Uh, it's beautiful stuff, but it takes a little trick to learn how to do it successfully. Um, and, uh, and what you end up with is wonderful stuff for the soil. Uh, it's, it's part of that whole notion. If you wanna grow a garden, feed the soil. Make sure the soil is alive. That's why we don't use chemicals, uh, insecticides, herbicides, any other kind of side that you can think of. Uh, it's better to use integrated pest management, the least uh, destructive method early on. And a lot of times, uh, if bad things are happening, we'll just grow more of it so that the bad things or the other things gets, get some of it and you have some left for you. I don't want to get too far into composting because I know it's always just such a, an interesting topic, but is there, do you have a, a recommend a recommendation for small <clears throat> for small spaces? Well, you can't go too small um, because it just won't work. Is it, uh, you, you know, you can actually, uh, uh, I don't want to get too far into the weeds as the Indian goes, but there is a method called buk Bokashi, which is you're using an enzyme and you can compost in a, in a five gallon bucket mm -hmm. where you put almost anything, including the meat and dairy in that bucket and you put some of this enzyme on top keep loading it in and the enzyme eats it up and you end up with compost. The other thing we haven't mentioned is worm composting. Yep. And that's a topic that a lot of people don't want to get into, but it's too bad because uh, you too can have 2000 uh, near and dear friends who live in your, in your uh, garage. Uh, I think we have some, don't we have a couple of um, worm bins at the conservatory? Better than yet, that, we have Kent Gentry. Yeah. Who knows <laughs> all about worms and uh, a wonderful uh, notion called compost tea. Yes. Uh, uh, take the material out of a compost bin and you, in a sense, brew a, a, a liquid that is a wonderful additive. Although there's not a lot of science that says that compost tea is, is great, but many users swear by it. So uh, mm. yes, Com you know, if you haven't been to the conservatory to look at some of the compost elements, uh, ask Kent to show you. Yeah. So I'd like to just interject um, first and foremost, um, Don, I, I mean, I have just been like on my tippy toes wanting to just get into the computer. I want, this was fascinating. I've been on the edge of my seat the entire time and we're talking about tools and it, you just, you present it in such a wonderful, engaging way. So I first wanna thank you for taking the time to do this presentation for our audience tonight. It was really stellar. And I also want to mention to everybody that um, Don will be joining us again on um, May 18th. I'm excited to announce that um, Don and Sandy Lentz will be um, part of our um, Get the Dirt, Ask Master Gardeners Your Gardening Questions. So once you kind of get into your gardening season and you have all these things you have on your mind, we will be doing a live Q&A program virtually um, so that you can ask your questions of every nature, um, so to speak, to Don and Sandy and um, one of our um, staff members from the conservatory. So um, this has been wonderful. Um, if there's anybody who wants to unmute themselves and say hi to Don, um, we are at the end of our program. Kayla will be our speaker next week. Ellen Kuhner will be one of our speakers in a couple of weeks. Um, Suzette um, who's not on tonight's call, I don't think, will be our um, speaker on um, 
edible gardening. So every week in April, we've got some great knowledge and um, material we're bringing to you. And we hope you will join us for that. Um, and then of course we have more programs going on. Kayla has done um, a fantastic job of sharing um, we're researching um, topics um, that you guys have told us you're interested in and um, we will be presenting. What have we got? Is there anything you wanna mention Kayla for fall that we're excited about? Oh my goodness, we have we have a ton of programming coming up in the fall. We have um, an, a lecture on orchids, um, which is you know obviously always really interesting. We have a lecture on African violets um, and that's just October alone. <laughs> And we have um, an urban um, forager talk coming up in June. So um, if you're curious about edibles or learning about how to enjoy um, the um, greens around you safely, um, we have, what, um, what is her name again? Nina? Nina, Nina Lauren. Yeah, so um, we're excited. We'll, we'll um, email you guys more information, but um, I invite you now to, um, to unmute or um, unhide yourselves if you want to come out and say hi to Don. But um, thank you, everybody, for um, joining us tonight. Um, I just, I, I promised you, if you were on that Garden Club Facebook page, I told you that when I ran through this with Don on Tuesday, it was going to be a great talk. And I, I only got a snippet of it, but man, it was good. So, so glad you could join us. <laughs> thank you so much. It was great.